Right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's uh, live podcast. This is uh, Adrian Booty speaking here. I'm the head of trading at Trendsyn. I'm here with uh, Jerry Miller. Uh, good afternoon, all. Hello. Um, hopefully the sound's working loud and clear. If you can hear me, just type hello into the questions box. And remember uh, that this is how you can ask questions as we do these live. So originally with our podcast, we're doing those recorded events. This is our, I think, our second uh, actual live version of this. And the purpose being is to really get a bit of participation, get a few questions coming in. We've got a couple of polls uh, to uh, ask you all later on as well. So it's going to be highly interactive just to get as much out of this session as possible, guys. So please get into that questions box, get into the chat box there, and type those responses in, or ask any questions if you've got anything else you'd like us to go through uh, for today's session too. Uh, but look, um, Jerry, why don't we get straight into it, and let's have an idea about what happened last week. Okay, uh, just a quick rundown. Um, what we call a risk-on uh, week last week, so that's where investors, traders, fund managers uh, start to move more into equities. So bond yields uh, are... Uh, rising, i.e. bond prices are going down and equities are going up as investors and traders like to put their money to work, which is good news, you might say, but there isn't much alternative, is there? No, we, we've talked about this in recent weeks, haven't we? It seems yeah. to be the stocks are the only game in town. Tina, uh, really. Tina, I think they're called it. Yeah. There is no alternative. Actually, in the S&Ps, is, I've had to bring the S&P charts up, but that's sort of hit new all-time highs even today, pre-market, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. I think we were, uh, you know, latter part of uh, August we hit the highs. I know we attempted it in uh, early September, but uh, yeah, here we are again. Uh, it's extraordinary when you think how badly the US is doing, uh, all those numbers. Uh, you know, when you look at Forex Factory and you see all those red numbers, you think, my God. We're at all-time highs. What is going on? And I'll tell you what's going on is they're, they're cutting rates <laughs> at a, quite a pace at the moment. Uh, and again, just to go back to what we just said, where else do you put your money there? And it's a topical week for rates uh, this week because we've got um, FOMC on Wednesday, Joey, don't we? Yeah, we, so that's the Federal Open Market Committee. That's what the FOMC stands for. We love for our mnemonics. Uh, that's the Rate Setting Committee for the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank. So that's that's the equivalent of our Monetary Policy Committee or NPC to throw another mnemonic at you. Uh, but yeah, a lot of bank. Uh, we've got some important announcements on that front. We've got Bank of Canada, Bank of Japan. Yeah, uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve in the US. So yeah, busy, busy all week. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what about what happened with um, some of the currencies last week? What, what happened to the dollar uh, well, last the dollar, week, Joe? See, the dollar had been uh, falling. Uh, has been falling ever since the beginning of October, really. And if you look at the euro here, um, that's a sort of a proxy for the dollar index, isn't it? But uh, just in the last week or so, it started to show signs of uh, reversing that trend. Uh, so the, that's the dollar starting to recover, but. I don't know whether it's a start of something else, but there's obviously concern uh, or hesitation ahead of the meeting on Wednesday, because obviously if the Federal Reserve don't cut rates, uh, the dollar will go through the roof. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about, about that a little bit later on when we uh, review the week ahead, yeah. uh, won't we? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. for sure. But uh, I guess Trump's, um, uh, the impeachment inquiry, that uh, continues on, doesn't it, really? Yeah, he's had some pretty tough news really Trump although I'm not saying I feel sorry for the guy but uh, uh, you know these impeachment inquiries are continue a pace in Congress and he's had more bad news about more people coming forward to testify but he did have a bit of a win uh, over the weekend getting this uh, Abu Bakir uh, whatever his name is uh, the head of ISIS uh, a long name who took his own life apparently whilst uh, having his compound storm but there you go he's had a win that'll help him yeah it seems to be these uh, impeachment inquiries. They're sort of relentless, aren't they? Sort of one after another, it seems to be. Or I, just... I, I, I think con Congress are going for him. They're, they're, they're using this, uh, the Ukraine, the Ukraine uh, issue over Biden and uh, Trump apparently using the uh, threat of withholding this uh, 400 million pound uh, uh, package that was to be given to the Ukraine only if, uh, and releasing it only if uh, they agreed to investigate uh, Joe Biden, who will be likely the uh, Donald yeah. Trump's uh, adversary in the uh, presidential elections next year. Mm -hmm. And that's an abuse of office, uh, alleged abuse of office and alleged action. So uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But, uh, what it all means for the FX markets, it all it all translates into the charts somehow, doesn't it, with the turns and the moves that we see. I, I suppose we don't have to get too bogged down into what's happening with Trump's impeachment. I guess all we really need to know is it does move the markets a little bit, but it's all on the charts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. If you think about it, every bit of 
news, whether it be anything to do with interest rates, unemployment data, or Trump, or the US-China trade war, it's built into the price, uh, and, the, the, and the price action is, the, is what we're interested in analyzing. As much as I can talk to you all about the, the news and events and stuff, uh, at the end of the day, everything that we talk about is built into the price, and it's that price action that matters. And weirdly enough, I've seen so many times when you know you see the market coming up with all sorts of news and uh, and so on, and yet the market, the charts can be extremely smooth. Um, it can be, it, it, it's odd like that, and you know, the markets will translate it onto the charts, and that's what we trade off. So really, for us. I guess a lot of it is knowing about where those banana skins are, where the possible big moves might come from, what the big news items are, so we can trade around those, uh, really. We're going to talk about that for the for the week ahead. So we've got a few bits this week, haven't we, Jerry? Uh, yeah, it's a very busy calendar, actually, Adrian. Um, it's unusual to have uh, interest rate news. Uh, well, obviously, we've got Brexit. Uh, more about that in a sec, but I don't want to waste too much time on that because it's all week long, every week. Um, but we've got... Um, a lot of important data, four central, three central bank meetings, and we've got the all important non-farm payroll. So the U.S. employment data. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's keep it all focused on the uh, the key ones. Yeah, I've got it all on screen there. Yeah, exactly. See. So, so what, what did I just spin through it and yeah. um, uh, just give everyone a, an update here? So um, we, we're on. Um, we, we're no longer British summertime, which basically means now there's a four-hour difference between us and the U.S. Uh, which means our markets, uh, so their markets open an hour earlier and close an hour earlier. So the difference is just four hours. Uh, but the good news is, unlike when I used to um, um, uh, run my own trading desk um, way, way back as a broker, um, we used to cover the North American markets. And sometimes you'd had a five or six week difference uh, in terms of when the US and the UK changed their times, which meant that yeah. in the spring, you'd be there until sort of 10, 11, 30, 11 o'clock at night waiting for the markets to close. But this is just one week, uh, and that's all we have to put up with. But uh, So normally we have data points in the US at sort of 1.30, 3 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock for FOMC, but everything's been shifted an hour yeah. earlier yeah. Uh, for us in the well, UK. I, so 12.32 and then 6 o'clock yeah, for I've already, I've already spoken to people this morning who said, you know, looking forward to the uh, announcement at seven o'clock on Wednesday. And I said, hang on a second, it's six o'clock, remember? Yeah. And they said, of course. And and what you do is you just get so drilled into sort of reacting at a certain time, knowing that yeah, from C going to meet, but it's it's six o'clock, not seven. Um. So listen, uh, the on the forex factor, they talk about this Parliament vote uh, on Brexit, but it's possible we're going to have a vote every day if Boris Johnson gets his way, because I think all he's interested in doing is. Uh, getting the Fixed Term Parliament Act uh, agreed so that uh, uh, Labour um, can join in with the vote to have, hold an election. But I think for the third time in asking, which is unheard of, that a British uh, a leader of the uh, Majesty's opposition has declined to get the chance to become, get into government, which is yeah. extraordinary. Um, but we've already had the EU extension. I'm sure everyone knows about that now. So the EU have agreed to an extension of three months. And it looks like there's a possibility that this Lib Dem SNP bill, which uh, is another act, a one page act that uh, says that we, you know, they can have a, a, an election on the 9th of uh, December if we've um, ruled out no deal. And I think ruled it, the no deal has been ruled out and it's likely that that could happen. I'm going to jump on Tuesday, yeah. uh, next one. Uh, consumer confidence is something that I like watching. Uh, I say I like watching. Uh, it, when it comes out, I think it, attract, it should attract more attention because it's really a good leading indicator. We talk about data that tells us what is going to happen and data that's telling us what has happened. Uh, and we've got two good examples of that this week. The CB Conference Board, Consumer Confidence, really is telling us, telling us how happy uh, the U.S. consumer is. Um, I guess for the retail market, it's quite important to move into Black Friday now. I mean, not too far away from that ghastly, uh, yeah. uh, ghastly thing, are no, we? No, no, and no, no, um, Cyber Monday, Christmas, you know, it's going to be no, quite no, a crucial no, one, I'd say. No, you're spot on. Uh, consumer confidence at this time of the year is absolutely key. Uh, but, you know, with a, with a move to record highs in equities, I think that, that can only help consumer confidence because people love to know that they're their, their, their the 401ks good. and yeah. whatever they want to call them are all performing well, which gives you more confidence. You're going to go out and spend, buy a car, buy some presents for the wife, even buy a house, I don't know, move <laughs> up a gear. Um, yeah, so that's a, a, a good number, a number that we like watching. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, 
uh, Aussie numbers. We've got too many to, to talk off here. But um, what I'd like to do is to quickly have a reference to the ADP data. Um, this is an important week for the markets because we've got um, employment uh, data out, which is pretty key. Uh, that's And this one is the ADP employment data. So why, why is that so important, Jerry? Why don't you let us know? Yeah, okay. It, employment. It's interesting because the central banks have got mandates to fulfill. Uh, most central banks have one mandate, which is to uh, ensure price stability. And most central banks do that. In fact, all central banks do that by uh, altering or managing interest rates. Um, the Federal Reserve actually has two, the US central bank. Uh, their second one is actually to foster full employment, which basically means that the employment data that's published has a direct impact on the Federal Reserve. Why are we interested in the Federal Reserve? Because they're the ones that set the interest rates. And interest rates can move the currency, can move bonds, can move equities. So it's pretty key. Is it really likely, though, that the ADP data announced five hours before the FOMC statement is uh, released is going to have much of an impact? OK, that's interesting. You're right. The question is, do the Federal Reserve have any forward guidance on this? Do they know any insight into it? I would say on the ADP, that's a private number. I would say no. Mm. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which pre releases the main one on Friday, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, but it basically means, really, by the time we come round to looking at the Friday's data, you know, the Fed would have made their announcement. I mean, it would have little impact. But, but important that you do understand that unemployment or employment data is really important to the markets, and that's why we follow it. Um, anyway, so that's ADP. That's a private payroll number. Uh, the worrying thing for the Federal Reserve is that the number of um, new jobs being created is just falling. Mm. And it's falling from an average. OK, ADP is a bit more volatile, but the average from, you know, from the national, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is falling from sort of 100 or 180,000. And we're talking about a number of 90,000 this month or for last month, which is pretty slow. It's another poor reading. But that's what the market's expecting. Uh, anyway, that's uh, ADP. So uh, we've, got, we've got a few central banks this week, though, haven't we? Yeah, we have. I'm going to jump to, I'll get onto the Bank of Canada, but just very quickly, we were talking about bits of data that are uh, telling us what is going to happen to, an, to the economy and what has, has happened. The GDP data is a measure of the value of goods and services produced by the US, and this is in the third quarter. Mm. Not very interesting, but that's a lagging indicator. It's telling us what has happened. So compare that with the consumer confidence we were talking about. I think that's more important. Anyway, back to the central banks. Bank of Canada. Uh, Bank of Canada, a bit weird. Uh, they have their uh, meeting just before the Federal Reserve. They normally like to follow what the US is doing, but actually I think it's highly unlikely that they're going to do anything. That's really what uh, we've been told. So there's going to be no change in uh, Canadian uh, interest rates, uh, but it is a bit unfortunate it's happening just before uh, the Federal Reserve, which is the next one I'd like to talk about. This is, I'd say in terms of importance, probably... Uh, the most important in the month, definitely. Yeah. Um, if there was a if there was a U.S. presidential election, I'd say that was probably more important. But aside from uh, an election, this is the most important. Um, it's a will they, won't they job. Uh, there are various media that are asking all these questions. The Financial Times wanted to know whether the Federal Reserve will signal a pause in uh, rate cuts, uh, and they've talked about doing a mid-cycle adjustment. It's all. It's all a bit weird, but it's not a mid-cycle adjustment anymore. It's it's a proper change in policy. I mean, we've seen for probably the last few weeks doing these podcasts that actually the the, the likelihood of a cut just seems to be get increasing, increasing as we go. So yeah. where, where are we looking now? Uh, yeah, the chances of cut. It's quite interesting. We, we use this tool from one of the um, markets, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they've got this... Uh, contract or a series of interest rate contracts that tell us or they imply the probability of a rate cut yeah. or a rate hike more to point. This is the current rate, uh, 175 to 200 or 1.75 to 2%. And there's a 94% chance that it changes to that to on Wednesday night. So yeah. I'd call, I don't know, 94%? I'd call it on. That's pretty, pretty strong. Odds on. Sorry. Yeah. Anything stronger than 75, 80% is pretty much a shoe in. Uh, so this is very so hard. The, the point be, being really that uh, we're so likely to have that cut. So that's really what's being factored into the market. So yeah. we're, we're, we're pricing. We've seen that impact on the dollar over the last week or so. But actually, um, 
if we don't cut, if they don't cut rates, that's going to have a significant impact. So what sort of price movement might we see if they surprisingly don't cut rates? Yeah, the, yeah, the surprise would be if they did, not if they do. Uh, the dollar would inevitably rally sharply because uh, it's factored in, the market's factored in lower rates, which means you've got less interest you're going to earn on your dollar deposits. But if they suddenly decide not to cut rates, then people are going to put their money back in dollars. Uh, because it's a better return than they were led to believe would be the case. So, uh, and obviously, equities love lower interest rates, and that's what they've been thriving on. If you look at the charts yeah. again, looking at the S&P 500, the rally that we've seen, it's all built around expectation of lower interest rates. Yeah. No lower interest rates, the market will absolutely miss a beat and fall, and fall sharply if it happens. It's highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yes. We'll see. Uh, okay. Um, and what about comments from the Fed? Um, so you, you, we love to hear from the Fed, um, and, and the, there's no sort of schedule uh, official speeches, but there is what we call um, the official statement. But it's the press conference afterwards. So, and this is a major event, and I, I sort of whittle on, whittle on about this. But at six thirty, that's and half an hour after they've made the announcement, you've got Jerome Powell or Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He'll be talking. Uh, and he'll take questions in this press conference. And that's when we find out a little bit more about what really motivated him to cut rates mm. or import, well, more importantly, if he decides to not cut rates. But mm. uh, let's just hope that doesn't happen. But that, that's when we'll hear from uh, the Federal Reserve on that. I mean, it, it's interesting with that. I mean, obviously, they, they, there's a, a, a small risk that they don't. Um, but it, it's one of those big data announcement points there where you just got to be a bit more careful with your with your um, with your trades really i mean to be honest we we don't tend to get too bogged down into trading over the data or worried about it too much it's more about the potential risk that might come from it so if you're sitting there talking about oh, what what should i do because we've got not, um, fomc on wednesday reduce risk coming into uh, that data just in case it's, it would be the the, the low risk that uh, the pragmatic way of doing things, really. So as an example, we put a note out to our customers, our trainees, uh, people who've been through our training programs. Uh, just earlier today, we were long the Dow. Um, actually quite like being long. Um, we were in a nice uh, position of profit after the trade that was open last week. But we put a note out simply to say, look, we're taking our profits here uh, on the basis that if it, if it don't cut, it's going to lead to a massive, or should, all other things being equal, into a massive fall on equities, and therefore it's not really worth the risk of running a trade like that over such data. That's really a point. Does that all make sense, everybody? I uh, hope so. Keep uh, keep getting involved in the questions box uh, there, guys. Um, you know, responding to those questions, asking any questions that you may have. Um, so, Jerry, what about the rest of the week then? So we still okay. Got, yeah, you know, just very quickly, because I know we've got other stuff to move into. But the Bank of Japan, another key central bank of the Japanese economy, the uh, third largest economy in the world. Uh, that's something we have to follow quite closely. They have had such low interest rates for so long, and they tend never to make any change. But there are rumors about a cut in interest rates in Japan. Reason being, everyone else is cutting theirs. The ECB, Federal Reserve, and the problem with the Japanese economy is that a strong Japanese yen, which has resulted from this, is not good. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, isn't that called currency manipulation? Uh, they would never admit to it. But if you cut rates, you will weaken your currency, yeah. typically. Yeah. And that's something that is rumoured, but for the time being... I, and I, just to be clear, why would they want to weaken their currency? Well, they want to weaken their currency because it makes their exports cheaper overseas. So it basically makes them more competitive. If you've got a strong yen, you're going to earn less in dollars, less in euros when you convert them back to yen. And the thing about Japan is they're a very big exporter, a net exporter, aren't they? Huge. Absolutely huge. They repatriate vast quantities of, Jap uh, of uh, euros and uh, dollars and sterling, uh, and that has to be converted back to yen. Uh, a strong yen is not what they want yeah. for that purpose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then Friday we've got a little thing called uh, non-farm payroll, really, haven't we? Yeah, this has all been NFP, uh, employment data, unemployment data, has all these different names, but... Uh, yeah. I mean, normally that would be the most important item of data for the week, but... Um, like upstaged a bit by FOMC. Yeah, yeah. It, it, we're going to know about but the key key release is going to be Wednesday evening. By the time we get to Friday, it's I'm pretty certain that the Federal Reserve have uh, forward warning of uh, the the data, so they will take that into account. Mm. Uh, not that that's necessarily going to sway them. I, I just think it would be a real shock if they don't cut rates. So it actually 
sort of uh, reduces the impact of this non-farm non -farm employment data, which is normally probably an equal par with uh, an interest rate decision, but uh, certainly because it's all happening within two days of each other, I'm afraid it uh, becomes second best in terms of its impact this week. Yeah. Good. OK, well, hopefully that's a good uh, intro on what's uh, happening for the week ahead. What I wanted to do is just go through something a little bit different uh, today and try and get a bit of interaction. One of the, the good things about doing these sessions live is participation. Uh, and I've got a couple of polls, um, which I'm just going to pop up through onto the um, on your screen. So if you're on the live session rather than watching the recording after the event, you can actually get involved and interact now. And I'm gonna go with a poll straight up and you can just check the box that comes up on the screen. Um, launch that now, uh, guys. And the question uh, simply is, how much trading experience do you have? And if you just answer now quickly on the questions box, on that um, uh, poll there, just type on the screen on the thing that pops up let us know about your experience so far. So the reason I'm, I'm interested in this is because as we launch these podcasts, we're about four or five weeks into it now. Um, we're a bit slow to the party, perhaps. We want to make sure that we're getting the best content out to you guys. I don't want to be pitching it too advanced uh, or too beginnerish uh, based on the people that are attending. So uh, again, guys, if you haven't got on there, a few more people, please, still haven't typed in. Get onto that uh, poll there. It seems to me we've got a real wide split, Jerry, which is uh, probably not really what I was, uh, I was expecting. So we're looking at around 43% of you have never traded. 50% uh, 50, 50 have traded for more than uh, three years. Um, so pretty even split and no one kind of in between, which is uh, a little bit weird, um, but that's fine. What that means is that we just have to pitch it in different ways. So we have to get a little bit technical, but also uh, just make sure we explain uh, those technical elements uh, as we go through. So I appreciate that. Thank you for that. I'm just going to close that poll off now. Uh, and I've got one more, uh, actually. Um, and, and that is really to get an idea about you uh, in terms of your trading. So uh, the next question is, what is preventing you? from getting started with your trading, okay? If you're brand new, you're one of the ones that hit the, I've never traded before, what is preventing you from getting started to trading? Or perhaps if you are already trading, but maybe not getting the great results, what is preventing you from getting the, your best results there? You can check more than one of these uh, on the poll there. So just check whichever one you think is, uh, is appropriate for you. So what is preventing you from getting started with trading or being profitable? Um, number one, I am not confident that I'm entering the right trades. Number two, fear. And I get nervous, which impedes my decisions. Number three, I don't think I understand enough to be profitable. Or number four, it seems rather complicated and sometimes I feel a bit overwhelmed. Uh, or perhaps number five, a lack of time uh, is preventing you there. Please get into that um, poll, everybody. Click on those boxes there on the screen, uh, whichever is most appropriate for you, please. Um, again, the reason we're getting out is really, again, just understanding what people are interested in, what they want to hear from these podcasts. What I don't want to do is have a, a, an empty session where no one's really interested in what we're talking about. So the more we know about you, the attendees, the listeners, uh, the more relevant uh, we can make uh, these sessions there. So, um, okay, so what are we getting? What sort of responses are we getting? I'm going to close that off now uh, and actually push that uh, uh, back and go through it now. So thank you very much for responding. So what are we saying here? A few people saying, uh, I'm not confident that I'm entering the right trades. A few people very fearful. Um, knowledge seems to be an issue, uh, Jerry. Um, perhaps people overcomplicating things, um, thinking it's too complicated and not understanding enough. And what I'd like to do is just share a few moments to talk about some of those points, uh, really. But thank you uh, for participating there. What I'd like to do is actually just start off with the two most uh, popular responses there, um, really. Uh, in fact, no, let's just start from number one. Uh, I'm not confident that I'm entering the right trades. For me, this seems down to be uh, getting a right entry strategy. For a lot of the time when I'm speaking to people, you know, a lot of people want to get into trading. They know it's a great thing to be into, but don't actually know, I guess, how to go about it or how to actually enter that first trade. Maybe they've got a trading account. Maybe they funded it. And it's a bit like that. Well, what now? Well, what I say to you is this. Buy into a concept, a style of trading that you can identify with and then test it in that way. So, for example, for me, when I started trading back in 2002, I was interested in stock trades back then. 
and I was looking at value, I was looking for markets that were cheap and looking to basically buy cheap and buy, you know, expecting the prices then to rise. It wasn't a very good strategy, but it's something that got me into trading in the first place. Actually, the more I got into it and, you know, the more I then started researching about trading, the simple concept that I wanted, something I could then believe in, was about looking at longer term trends and then looking for turning points in the market. And that's very much how we position ourselves here at TrendSignal now, which is all about identifying that longer term trend and then looking for, I guess, simple entry points back in line with that longer term trend. The irony is that it's how most people speculate in their day to day lives. We're talking about, say, the Rugby World Cup, you're talking about horse racing. Generally, what people do is they they bet, they speculate according to trends, according to the, the, the team that's in form, the horse that's in form. Um, I guess perhaps why a lot of people were back in New Zealand <laughs> uh, on the weekend, uh, expecting that they were the form, not necessarily the form horse, but they're the seasoned winner, really, aren't they? Let's face it. Trading is very much in the same sort of way. You know, for me, it was about identifying the concept first. What could I believe in? What was the right style of trading for me? Which is about identifying those longer term trends and then turning points, trading opportunities in those longer term directions there. And I've talked about, you know, opportunities like this, like Euro dollar. You can see very clearly, very visually those turning points that we see on our charts that you could as well if you went through our training programs. But it's all about a simple way of identifying those turns. And I guess that comes back to some of those other things that people are talking about there, the lack of confidence, that uh, the complication, not knowing enough. Trading's like anything else, really, Jerry, that you, you don't have to know everything about the market. You just need to know what you need to know. That, well, that's right. The, the, the problem with it, it, it sometimes gets overwhelming. You look at the business pages of the BBC, just to start with, you look at any newspaper, God knows, if you go to the FT and try to read some of the headlines and then work out a trading strategy, you'd be dragged from pillar to post and back again, and you won't make any progress because yeah. you remember a lot of what you read and a lot of what you hear is after the event. And, <coughs> and our issue is trying to work out what is the market telling us, yeah. not what a media company or the FT or the Sun or the Mirror or the Telegraph or the Times are telling us. And this is always why we use a price analysis. And that's what we're looking at when you look at a chart. It, it's, it's, it's difficult for some people uh, to trade when they think about, oh my God, I've got to take into account this, that and the other. You don't. You need to look, have a simple strategy that revolves around an analysis of price action. That's what makes it simple. Because it all translates through to the chart. And I speak to so many traders. I, I don't know if anyone ever, ever feels like this, but you're constantly sort of reading this, looking at that, your eyes being, you know, attention being diverted by this news, by this media and so on. Uh, just tr in the quest of trying to find some sort of snippet of information that's going to help you to trade. Actually, trading news is a very difficult thing to do uh, unless you're first to know about it. And unfortunately, we rarely are, uh, really. Well, we are retail clients and so definitely not the first to. You, yeah. You'll get hedge funds that are very, very clever. But they employ a lot of clever people. They've got millions and millions, tens, hundreds of millions of pounds at their disposal. And of course, they will be the ones to react first. We're likely to get in... 10 seconds, five seconds later. But believe you me, when you get some news that cause the market to spike, that's the difference. And the problem is that's kind of scratching around, trying to pick up a few scraps, really, isn't yeah, it? Over what is a very difficult way of trading. It's not, not really trading, it's reacting. That is. It's reacting. It's also highly emotional as well. It's this sort of emotionally charged, fast moving market that for the vast majority of people, it's just an unpleasant way to trade. Uh, I think. Uh, actually, I, I don't tend to hear too many people who are very successful trading over news. Don't get me wrong, news creates movement, but a lot of it is already factored into the charts. And so, you know, when you're talking about looking for entry opportunities, people do all sorts of things. They look at support and resistance. Some people might trade commodities based on the seasons that we're in, believe it or not. Some people trade stocks based on their dividend program. Some people are looking at sentiment and how overbought or oversold markets are. Uh, some people average in a ghastly thing called average in or martingale style strategies. What I say to you is find something that breaks down the complexity. You know, we've talked a little bit today uh, in here about not, in, so a lot of you saying, I don't think I understand enough. You don't have to understand everything about the market. You have to know 
what you need to know. And a lot of it is translated in the chart. You don't have to be an economics whiz. You don't have to have a PhD in maths. If you've got a right strategy that's also be, already been tested, already been used, already been proven and so on, it's actually going to simplify that whole process uh, really for you. And I look at all these different indicators that people apply on the charts. We've seen some horrendous looking charts from people in the past, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that, just just yeah. with 20 different indicators. Look, look like the London Underground map. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. For me, it's about a simple uh, approach. And actually, I kind of liken trading in, in many ways to lots of other things. We, we always have lots of car analogies. I often tend to translate it back to golf because that's really what I do. You know, I play in matches. I speak to, to, to people on the golf course. So many people overcomplicate their golf. And I remember having a match a few years ago with a guy who was saying, oh, yeah, I'm just going to try and just, you know, just, just fade it in here. I'm just going to take a little bit off and do this here. And I'm going to cut it in. I do this. I, just hit the thing. <laughs> This is it, because actually, you know what you've got to do, simple approach, you know, backswing, follow through and all that sort of stuff. And it's the same thing with trading. Don't overanalyze it. The more you overanalyze things with your trading, I'll tell you what will happen. You'll become paralyzed because there'll always be something that will hold you back, something that will prevent you from placing that trade, um, something that will... Uh, exaggerate the doubt uh, that's really in your mind. What do they call that? Paralysis by over or over analysis yeah. creates paralysis. Yeah. 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 So, not, uh, not a good thing uh, at all. What I suggest people do, and talking about it seems rather complicated or I don't think I understand enough, you've got to focus on the basics. Get the basics right, just like anything. Get the basics right in driving, get the basics right in golf. Basics like in rugby, who knows? Um, the basics right in trading, and you really are 80 to 90 percent of the way there. And that's where I think strategies like like ours can really simplify that process up. Identify those longer term trends. Get on the right side of the market. I.e., are you backing a form team? Are you backing a market that's more likely to rise over time? You need a simple way to understand those longer term trends. For us. We use these arrows that we have on the chart here. These are the tools that we use and that our clients use. That gets us on the right side of the market. What we're then looking for, everybody, is looking for trades, turning points back into that longer term direction. Does this all make sense? Probably feels like a little bit of a rant there, actually. But yeah. it's, it's interesting looking at feedback. Uh, looking at polls like this, getting an idea about where people are sort of struggling. Um, one other thing uh, that people are struggling with is, is time, uh, Jerry. And I guess um, for a long time, people have sort of thought about trading as being something you need sort of seven or eight hours a day to do. That's just not the case, is it? No, I, I think people look at, you know, films with trading places where people are in the middle of a pit trading like mad. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, if you think about it, you know, you, you can take any view you wish, or you can look at any time scale you wish, but I, I think make it, keeping it simple means basically making fewer decisions, not more decisions. And by, by just keeping it simple at the beginning, and that's why we promote end of day trading initially, uh, for people to get into the, uh, the market, the business of trading, it basically limits your time that you have to invest in it. Yeah. And, and that's key, uh, it's practical, and it's something that you can digest and you can make it as complicated as you wish after that. But the important thing is getting it right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, look, um, that, that kind of brings us towards the end of the, uh, the session, really. Um, what I'd like to do is invite you to one of the live uh, trading events we've got this week. I mean, where we're going to be sort of introducing uh, the strategy you're looking at here, how we identify those trades and how you can look to start using some of these indicators as well. I'm just going to put a link up on the chat. Uh, window there. So if you'd like to book yourself a free place uh, onto uh, one of our upcoming events, just click on that link and you can get yourself booked in where we'll teach you uh, that strategy. In fact, I'm just going to post it again because it's put a couple of chevrons in there. Um, so you can click that link, and you can book a place because what that will do is it will teach you an entry strategy. It'll help you talk about and overcome those fears uh, with your trading and help you get past uh, any issues you may have 
to help you to take that plunge, if you like, into placing uh, the right trades. Um, now, guys, remember these live sessions, you can participate, you can interact. If there are any questions, anything that you would like us to cover off on, there is a survey that will launch immediately after today's session. Or if you are uh, attend uh, watching the recording of this, instead of listening to it live as we're talking now, there'll be a link to the survey included in that email as well. Complete it. We can go through anything you might want to uh, in these sessions. Trading related, obviously. Yeah, thanks very much for attending. Yeah, good luck. All the best and bye-bye for now.